Um, I want to welcome you all back to the school year. I know some of you are already started and others you've got a few weeks to go, but we're excited to have you all here. We're excited that you've uh, been willing to take on this responsibility and help reach your students out there and give them that college experience. So what we're going to be going over today, um, we've got several items. First of all, we'll give you some updates on the new instructor onboarding training. Uh, we've, we've done some revisions to that. So for those of you who are new, that this is your very first uh, year, first semester teaching concurrent enrollment, um, we're going to introduce you to the new onboarding training. Uh, we have uh, uh, some information about Canvas review replacing the syllabus review process. We used to have you upload a syllabus and then your faculty liaison would review that to make sure that everything that you're teaching aligns with what the college expects you to be teaching for your concurrent enrollment class. That is changing over to a Canvas review. We'll talk about that. Um, next, granting your SLCC faculty liaison access to your Canvas course. Uh, that's going to be a big question because if the liaison is going to review your Canvas course, how do you give them access to that if you're using the high school Canvas or Slick Canvas? So we'll talk about that. Uh, next is integrating Simple Syllabus with your high school Canvas. So the college is moving towards requiring everybody to use Simple Syllabus and how can you do that in the high school Canvas versus the college Canvas? We'll talk about non-compliance and things that you should know. Changes to the general education requirements coming up in fall of 2025. Uh, we'll go over, uh, we're discontinuing annual discipline specific professional development. I'm going to talk about that and what that means. And then uh, we have the CE liaison best practices. So for those of you who are new or you've been around for a while, we're going to talk about your experience in working with the college experience liaisons and what you can expect uh, over the next year. And then last of all, we'll go through the CE liaison evaluation and student course evaluations. Um, but before I jump in here, one more thing that I needed to bring up. First of all, we had we ordered food for like 300. We have uh, about 150 here. So if you're hungry, like there is a ton of food out there. And if your family is hungry, <laughs> uh, when you leave, take a bag and, uh, and take whatever you want. We'll have some Ziploc bags and other things out there if you want to carry some food with you. So you're welcome to do that. Um, the other thing too is if you haven't gotten a stipend form yet uh, to get paid for attending this, we give you, I think it's like 50 bucks uh, for attending. You'll want to pick that stipend form up out there. And then in the very back of this room, right between those two doors, we got a little box where once you filled that out, you can put it in the box. Make sure that you put your, uh, all of your information on there, that you sign it, like you have to sign the form. And, uh, and if you know your S number, like we really need the S number to look you up, we can, we can find other ways to look you up, but it'll save our office staff a lot of time if you can find your S number and put that on there. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna turn the time over to Pace Gardner, our uh, English college experience liaison, and he's gonna go over uh, updates to our new instructor onboarding training. for the camera, and then that's for the area. All right, good morning everybody. Like Brandon said, I am the Humanities CE Liaison. So if you teach a Humanities course or Let's see, what else do I cover? Music, uh, French, if they teach French courses. I'm your college experience for that. And if you're an English teacher, I'm your content liaison as well as your college experience liaison. And I'm gonna talk about that first bullet point, the new instructor training course. So when you become a CE instructor, the first time that you are gonna teach CE, you need to be onboarded with a whole bunch of information that relate to college procedures and that kind of stuff. And um, we have about 150 new teachers in this new instructor training course. And so it made it really difficult to get people either together to uh, train or go individually. And we had to do one of those two things. 
So we figured that uh, an easier thing to do would be to make an asynchronous course that teachers could do when they're not super busy and overwhelmed to get them onboarded with all the tasks necessary to teach CE for the first time. So if you are one of these new teachers, you would have received an invitation, a course invitation, through Slick's Canvas to the new CE instructor training course. And this is the thing that we designed and built. Uh, this uh, has some basic instruction stuff, and what it is, was just a simple way for us, number one, to get the information to everybody that needs it, and then number two, track who has actually seen this information. So if you're new and you haven't seen this yet, you have that invitation, there are some instructions in your email on how to get it for everybody else, and just so everybody's aware, even returning teachers, we just have some simple modules built in here with a video and then a quick quiz afterwards. I think most of the quizzes are softball questions. I was trying to make them that. We wanted some basic understanding. And then more importantly, there's so much information that can kind of be overwhelming and remembering everything I, I think is a challenge. So within these, uh, I don't know, mod, excuse me, within these different modules along with the video, we have a whole bunch of links that are extra additional resources. So you don't have to memorize um, how to access everything all the time. Once you've completed the course and you're, you know, proved a basic knowledge of the things that we need to onboard you with, you also have these resources later on to go back to, to check this stuff out. And if you've forgotten how to do something, you can still go back into the module and then check those out. This will be really, I think, important for instructors at the end of a semester when they're trying to enter grades or export things or, or stuff like that. Um, once you're done with this course, if you're one of the people that's registered to take it right now, after you go through the nine different modules, there's a couple of supplement, supplemental modules too, then you just, uh, the last thing would be to complete a stipend form and submit that in. So we need to make sure that everybody's aware this thing exists. If you're a new instructor, make sure that you're completing it. If you are a returning or ongoing instructor, you don't need to complete this course. So if you taught CE a few years ago, took a couple years off, now you're coming back to it, you don't need to do this again. This is for brand new uh, instructors to go through. And we wanna make sure everybody completes it and then gets paid for their time. Um, make sure that I've mentioned everything that I want to for you guys. And if you are struggling to find the invitation to the course or something like that and you're a new instructor, you can send uh, any of us an email or my office an email and we will make sure that you guys have access to this course. And we just ask that it is complete either by August 20th or by when you begin teaching your course. So I think Granite starts a lot sooner than everybody else. So if you're a Granite teacher, make sure you're done before the first day because this includes some startup stuff. Um, if you're Canyons or another district, just make sure it's done before the first day of classes. Uh, any questions on that? Okay, I'll turn it back over to uh, Brandon. All right, perfect. Okay, so the next thing, let's jump back over here, is Canvas review replacing the syllabus review. So I'll give you a little background on this. We met with the, a lot of the faculty liaisons here at the college, and with simple syllabus coming into the picture and a lot of people using Canvas uh, instead of having a Word doc or a PDF doc, um, it became a little cumbersome to, to try to figure out how to get the syllabus from Canvas over into my CE, review that, give feedback, go in, update. Like there, were, there was a lot of back and forth and just unnecessary waste in the process. And, uh, and then also in talking to faculty, I said really looking at a, can, at a uh, syllabus, like we, th th we don't know for sure like if all the curriculum is being covered, are they using our quizzes and all that kind of stuff. What we'd really love is to have access to their Canvas course or for them using Slick Canvas. Now we've talked before, for those of you who've been around for a while, there's no one great solution. Like if you use the Slick Canvas, there are issues you have to deal with in double entering grades into the high school system. If you're using the high school Canvas, then you lose out sometimes on some functionality and also being able to share that with your liaison is difficult. So we needed to figure out a solution to make it as easy as possible for you to be able to share that with the faculty liaison. And so I'm gonna have David come up in just a second here and show you how this is done, but I wanted to jump over to our website. So in order to grant your liaison access to your Canvas, I reached out to all of the districts, each of the major districts, and tried to contact the chief information officer and find out how would an instructor in your district give an SLCC employee, a faculty member, access to their Canvas course. I wish it was like the same for every district, 
but it's not. Some were like super easy. They're like, yeah, just send me a list of your faculty liaisons with their email address. We'll add them into the system. The instructor just goes in and adds them and then they're, you're done. Um, others are like, I have to go through all this security protocol and special training and other things. Um, so what we did in order to make it as easy as possible for you, we created this website. So slcc.edu forward slash concurrent enrollment forward slash instructors and forward slash canvas HTML. Um, I'm going to show you how you can get to that, but I'm going to click here. We're going to jump over and show you this page. So right here on the canvas page, it walks through. If you're using the SLCC canvas, this is how you add your faculty member. If you're using, if you're in the canyons district, then follow these instructions. We even include the individuals that you need to email if you're having an issue. Um, so that hopefully you can get that taken care of very easily. Same with Jordan, Granite, Murray, and Salt Lake. If you're in a charter school, every charter school is gonna be different. So uh, we'll have to leave that up to you and your liaison. The, the most important thing is that you, that you talk with your faculty liaison to find out what do they prefer. Some, some might say, no, we really, like we need you using the slick canvas. Others say, I don't care, like as long as I can access it. Um, so that, the, so this Canvas review will replace it. Now the other question is, how does my liaison get the link to my Canvas course? Like, how do they know? Are they going to get an invite? Well, we've changed the syllabus review in my CE where you used to have to upload a file to now you just copy the link from your Canvas course. So you go into your Canvas course, copy the, uh, the link up here, and then paste that into a field in my CE and submit it. And then the liaison can go through, review that, click on the link, make sure they've got access, review it, send you feedback, and then finalize that when everything looks great. So that's the, uh, the review process. David, you want to come up and show them really quickly how um, they add uh, the uh, a faculty liaison into their Canvas course? I always love this moment when there are 200 people looking at you trying to do something and it's not quite working. Um, so yeah, so this, this is just, this is just a, kind of a new element of the conversation that we're having. I think this is something that a lot of us are already doing where we're talking about Canvas and we're talking about content on Canvas and we're trying to figure out what our best practice is. We're just trying to formalize it a little bit and create a procedure for it. So if you're using SLCC's Canvas, you can navigate to this page We'll send out a link to this page with some notes from the meeting, so we'll get this to you. Um, but we're gonna look at this form right here. And this is a request form that goes to SLCC's e-learning team. And we're gonna, we're gonna enter some information. So, you know, I might say like, oops. David Curl, and then I'm gonna enter this information. As Brandon mentioned before, we've copied the Canvas course, um, which I'm not gonna try to navigate back to you, but you would paste the URL in here, and then you would provide the username here. Uh, you'd work through to pick a role, so you can decide how much access you want your, your faculty liaison to have, although I would say we probably wanna give them the greatest amount of access possible, right? They're, they're looking at them as a co-collaborator, as a co-editor over your course. Hopefully they're already really familiar with it. Um, so we would set them maybe as a teacher uh, and we probably want to give them edit in simple syllabus, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we click submit. And within about, I would say 26 or 24 or 36 hours, um, they're going to get a notification saying that they've been added to your course. And then they can look at it just like anybody else can. And again, this is about co-collaboration. And it's about you being able to really quickly say, hey, I've got a problem with Canvas. Can you take a look at this? Um, which could be helpful, I think, uh, because the systems we have in place now are really informal and a little bit cumbersome. Um, does anybody have any questions about adding people through SLCC? Yeah. I might have just missed it. What role do we add our liaison? That, that's a great question. I, we don't have a specific, um, um, specific information about that. I, if, I were, if I were in your shoes, I would add them as like a teacher. I would give them the full slate of power and just say we want to give them as much access as possible. Because it's the case that the first time we did this was in 2020 when, when the state shut down uh, schools, I added into a bunch of Canvas courses and, and I found, uh, oh, is this, hello? Oh, I need to be by this, okay. Sorry, too many microphones. Um, this is why we need good collaboration, right? 
Otherwise, you look a little foolish. So in 2020, we added people into Canvas, and we found that people were using Canvas courses differently all over the place. And we found that if you give somebody in this role like a student view, they may not be able to go and see everything they need to see. So like if you added me to your course today as a student or something, I may not be able to see assignments. I may not be able to see test banks. I may not be able to see a lot of that information that would be really critical as a co-collaborator. So I would say here in this area, like teacher, you know, the greatest access possible. Just think of them as just a co-editor on it. If that, does that answer that question though? Great question, please. Can I interrupt? Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. So that's just a tale of woe that you may want to think of. While that, I appreciate the teacher aspect, I really don't want a million emails and know which ones I'm supposed to respond to. See, see, this is why we have kind of deliberative communication, right? Um, this is, this, so yeah, so, Sean, so following Shauna's lead, we'll say choose reviewer, all right? Please. Awesome, so let's choose reviewer. Is everybody hearing that? <laughs> reviewer, all right? Never let it be said that we're not willing to change our minds about things. I'm a flip-flopper. I thought I saw one more hand, please. Can you go up to the one just before this one? Yep. Okay, the name of the user you want to add, that's your liaison username and nest number? So, so that's mine. Um, you, would, you would need to find out, yeah, your, your faculty liaison and college experience liaison's usernames. You have to find that out from that. Yeah, and we can look, that's, Pretty easy to find. It's it's usually embedded in our email address. Not always. Anyway, we can we can get that to you. So yeah, great questions. Wonderful questions. Any others, please. Okay. So yeah. So also through S number. So username or S number. So thank you. Thank you. Cool. All right. You all are great. Thanks. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. I've got the, you can go into the Canvas course that I've got open there if you want. The okay. Instructor things, I think it's all the same, right? <clears throat> so, um, so yes, the other way to do this is uh, depending on the school district you're working in. And again, we, we're working with five plus school districts that all have different policies based on, you know, different goals and, 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 and different perspectives. But um, generally speaking, if you have the ability to add users, we can go down to people. And we have a guide for this that we can share out. It's sort of a step-by-step -step PowerPoint guide that you can look at. But if we go to people, so the current user logged into this course doesn't have this permission, but right up here, there will be an option to add people. So this is something you'll, if you're using, if you know already that you're not using SLCC's Canvas, and you know that you're using your school district's Canvas, you'll want to work with your school district's Canvas administrator to get permission to add users, right? That's not a default permission. You, you kind of have to work with people to do that. You have to work with people at Slick as well to do that. I can show you how to do that at Slick. I can't necessarily show you how to do it on your, your district side, but you'll want to email them and contact them and say, hey, I need to be able to add users to my course. There would be a field right up here in this corner that would say plus people, and you can go through and enter. Like you could enter my SLCC email address. I'm green listed in all of the districts. So you could say, I want David Curl to be on my site. So David Curl at slcc.edu, and I would get a notification that would let me then log into your Canvas site. And we have a step-by-step -step guide for how, how to do that within Canvas. But this might mean reaching out to somebody at your district and saying, hey, do I have the ability to add users to my course? And if they say no, then you need to say, hey, what, what do I need to do to get that permission? Does that make sense for everybody? All right. 
Questions, concerns, thoughts about that? How are we feeling? Cool, okay, so we have, again, if you're, not, if you're not catching all of this, you don't need to absorb it all right now. We have a slate of guides that walk you through the steps for doing it. And we'll share those with you in an email at the end of the meeting. We'll send that out to you and you can kind of play around with it. This is experimental. We're, 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 we're figuring this out. And so, you know, expect some hiccups at the beginning, but you have a team of people who are really committed to making this work for you in a way that is hopefully as unobtrusive as possible. So um, keep us informed. Let us know and we'll work through this and we'll, we'll get it done. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and, and I'll just uh, reiterate too, like on this uh, Canvas page, so let me show you how you get there from the concurrent enrollment website. But again, we'll send out a link. Um, so from the concurrent enrollment website, you go into the instructor section right here, which is your page. And then on the left-hand navigation are instructor policies and procedures, and pretty much everything is listed under here. And right at the very top is Canvas, and that's how you get to that page. So. I would uh, look at your specific district, see what the instructions are for adding uh, SLCC faculty into your, into your district. And then the contact person, like I said, is listed for each district. So you'll probably go through and maybe you even recognize that individual. Okay, so hopefully it'll, it'll all work out. But yeah, like David said, uh, we'll, we expect that there will probably be a few issues here and there that we need to be working on. Okay, the next thing thing, let's go back here, is non-compliance and what to expect if you drop the ball. Um, just wanted to give everybody a heads up on what our process is for handling issues of non-compliance. So the balls that should never be dropped are the following. So signing your annual agreement in MyCE, super easy. You log into your MyCE, or My, MyCE account and then you hit agree and that's it, like pretty easy. The next one is completing the new instructor onboarding before the first year you teach or the first semester you teach. So before you teach a concurrent enrollment class um, for the first time, you have to have completed that onboarding training. So that's the other thing. The next one is completing the SLCC curriculum training before you teach. So before you teach a college class, you have to have received training on the curriculum for that class. When you got your approval letter, you should have received an email that included your faculty liaison that said, hey, you need to get this training done and, and it connects you to the individual, I think. I think we do that. Um, but if not, you can always find the name of your faculty liaison and their contact information in my CE. We send reminders to them to reach out to you as well to schedule and coordinate that training. The next one that should never be dropped is giving your faculty liaison access to your Canvas course through my CE. So we'll be working on that um, over the next month or so, trying to get that, make sure we, we've got that working. Next is attending any mandatory trainings that are required by the SLCC academic department. And I'm gonna, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about profession, annual discipline specific professional development going away. Next one is responding to your faculty liaison in a timely fashion and then facilitating classroom visits. And finally, covering the SLCC curriculum in full as outlined by the SLCC academic department. So those are the seven like critical things that we need to have happen in order to ensure that we can tell our accreditors that what happens in the high school class is identical to what's happening on the college class as much as is possible. So if you drop the ball, then what happens? So first of all, you would receive probably up to three friendly reminders depending on the nature of the problem. I mean, if, we, if, if a liaison goes in your class and you haven't taught any of the college's curriculum for like a month or so, then it'll be a little more, uh, we'll, we'll have to move a little quicker on getting that one corrected. So you'll, first you'll receive three friendly emails to say, hey, just so you know, like we don't have on record that you've completed this training or they you haven't signed your agreement. If you could do that, that would be great. And then another reminder and another reminder. Um, if we get no response on those three reminders, then uh, then at that point we include your administration because we don't know if we have a bad email address, if you're just not getting it, or if you're just ignoring it. Hopefully most teachers are not just ignoring it. But the, it goes to the administration afterwards. On the third step, uh, you'd be given a timeline for improvement with consequences for not completing those tasks. And then if satisfactory changes have not been made, 
um, at the end of that timeline, then at that point we would cancel your current or future classes just depending on the circumstances. So if it's something we catch early on and it's very significant, we may have to cancel the class and drop the students. On the other hand, if this is something that ha that's been going on and we catch it at the end, and then we'll let you teach out your class, but then we would cancel the future ones. Luckily, we almost never have to get to number four and, and, uh, and well, number three and number four. So, um, but we're just letting you know that this is the process we follow if there is an issue and not doing one of uh, the following things. So the last thing that I have on here, number five, is if we drop the ball, which we do sometimes, um, and our records are incorrect, which has happened before, we send out a reminder and say, hey, you haven't completed your new instructor uh, course content training with your, with your SLCC department representative. And you're like, no, I just met with my faculty liaison last week and we did this. Like, I've, I've done my training. Then just let us know that that happened and then we'll go correct our records to make sure that, that uh, you're not on that list anymore. So yeah, and that's it for non-compliance. Any questions, concerns on that? Okay, let's move on to um, some other topics here. The next one is uh, changes to the SLCC general education requirements. Some of you may have got an email from me last, uh, last semester, well, spring semester, that said, beginning fall 2025, Slick is gonna be making some pretty significant overhauls to general education. Part of the reason for this is because Right now, there are, I think it's like 34 credits required for general education at Salt Lake Community College. A lot of the other four years only require 27 credits. So we wanted to figure out a way to better align what we do with the four years so that we students, well, it saves students money and it saves them time and, uh, and some headaches. So here are the changes uh, to the requirements. Uh, if you got a chance to pick up the Gen Ed Certificate of Completion Checklist, you can see what the current requirements are. So there's a written composition, which is EN, that's changing to WC, but it'll be written composition. That one stays, and those are the, the English classes. The American Institutions also stays, no change there, three credits. And the Quantitative Literacy, the QL, is, doesn't change as well. That stays, stays on as a core Gen Ed requirement. The distribution areas are changing to breadth areas. So just to explain, with general education, there are certain things that are required by the state, and then the state gives each institution the ability to select additional gen ed requirements up to a certain amount. So the core and then the breadth areas are Yushi mandated, like everybody has to offer these specific areas. So, we, so these are staying, fine arts isn't changing, humanities is still there, life science, physical science, and social sciences are all remaining the same. Where we're having some major changes is in the institution requirements. So communications will be going away as a gen ed requirement. That doesn't mean that the communications courses disappear, it just means that they would not count as a general education class unless the communications department does a realignment to figure out if they can align with one of these other categories, uh, which probably a lot are not gonna be able to, but who knows. Uh, international and global also goes away. Lifelong wellness, which is a class that they can only complete on a slick campus right now. It's the one credit PE cl credit where they can do scuba diving or rock climbing or yoga or Pilates or um, any of those. So that goes away. And also the diversity requirement. Uh, will be going away, which is a zero credit requirement. It's just one of the classes before had to be a diversity class. So those are the changes that are happening and go into effect fall 2025. So, and like I said, like no classes are disappearing. Uh, they just won't count for gen ed. Questions on the gen ed changes? Okay, hopefully this will be a really positive thing for the students in the long run. I know I was talking to a student the other day and we were talking about declining enrollments and the student was like, I think they should just get rid of general education. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, that, 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 would be, uh, that would be a very controversial topic, but 
But he had some good points. He said a lot of it, like as a student, what does a student want? What does our customer want? They want a better paying job that maybe they enjoy more than, than doing other jobs. Um, and if the gen ed, they don't understand like how that's leading to that, that can be really frustrating. I mean, I'd be frustrated if I was working on a project and I didn't know why this task I'm working on uh, ha has anything to do with the end goal. That would be like, I feel like I'm wasting my time and money. And that's the way students feel, I think. So hopefully reducing the number of gen ed classes will be a much better thing for the students in the long run. Okay. Um, oh, the question. Yes, go ahead. Yes. How does that affect the students that are already in the pipeline? Do they stick at 34 or do they get the benefit of the drop? So that's a great question. For students who are currently working towards their gen ed, if they are going to graduate um, during fall 2025 or before 2025, they would follow the current requirements. If they're going to graduate a year after that, like say fall 2026, then at that point, they can, they can begin right now working towards the new requirements, or they can, they can uh, continue working on the old requirements and request their catalog year be changed when they matriculate to Salt Lake Community College. So the catalog year for the student is, I think it's recorded when they start taking classes, and then it gets input into graduation when they matriculate to us. So they just have to request to graduate under the requirements from the old year if they want. So they'll have that option. Good question. Okay, let's see. So the next one is professional development and I believe Pace, uh, you were gonna take that one. And I think goodbye is one word, so that's a grammatical error. Uh, never mind. Uh, all right, so it's been a requirement that every teacher does um, annual professional development training, and that's been a standard for quite a while. We were revisiting, revisiting this last year, and we, we ran into a couple things that we think didn't make a lot of sense. So it works really well to do annual PD if you are changing your curriculum. So the English department is changing all of their curriculum this year. That made sense. We needed to have a big meeting. We've talked a lot about it. If your um, discipline isn't changing anything and they're just sticking with the same curriculum, it becomes really tricky on the teachers to figure out how do we account for that. So they have to be on record as having participated in PD, but they're not offering it. So it's this weird, I don't know, nether realm. And we would account for that in like, well, did you attend other related stuff? Did you go to and take an online class? And so it was just kind of a, a murky requirement. So rather than requiring everybody to fulfill this in some way that wasn't always perfect, we've decided to say goodbye to the required yearly training. And now it is um, on an as needed basis. So if you're teaching for the English department and they're changing their curriculum and requiring everybody to do a training on it, awesome. You have to participate in that. That's a requirement of your discipline and staying a CE teacher. If your department decides that that's not necessary, um, for example, Art 1010, they have a set thing, they're not changing anything, the department is not going to require it, then you don't have to figure out ways to fulfill that um, on your own. You can just ride along with your department. So it should make it easier um, for you guys to not have to deal with figuring out question marks related to your discipline. And if your department does decide for whatever reason, they're changing curriculum, they want to update it, whatever, to host these professional development things, you are still required to attend those which means within the MyCE system, it's not did they attend PD every year, it's did they attend a required PD, and hopefully that makes it easier on you guys moving forward and easier for our office to track who's successfully completing that stuff. Any questions on that one? All right, cool. Okay, 
Now I want to go over C liaison best practices and what to expect from your college experience liaison. So those of you who have been, have been around for a little while, you've had the opportunity to work with one of our four college experience liaisons. That would be Robert Thorne, Pace Gardner, David Curl, Trudy Richardson. So those are our four college experience liaisons. This summer we got together, or maybe it was earlier in the summer, I can't remember. We got together and talked about how can we like take what we do and pull out the best of what everybody does and provide a consistent experience for you all as instructors. And what are some of the key elements that need to be part of the college experience evaluation process and working with your college experience uh, liaison so that you're having a really good experience, you're getting some good information that can help you to grow as an instructor. So we sat down and came up with those and I'm gonna go through what uh, you can expect at this point as you're working with your college experience liaison. So first of all, you can expect that they will work hard so that the two of you can nurture a positive professional relationship. That's really important to us, that you have a positive relationship with your faculty liaison. So I'll be working on that. Next one, uh, that you always get a quick response Time. So that would be within 24 to 48 hours you can expect a response from them. Many, many of the liaisons respond faster than that. So sometimes within, within the day or within a few hours you'll get a response because we want to be there and be able to support you the best we can. Uh, next, that the evaluation process will be a positive experience with use, useful takeaways. Your college experience liaisons are not there to try to figure out what you're doing wrong. They're there to try to help you to grow and to become better at delivering a college experience. And uh, they've gone through different training and, and experience to try to give you good feedback on what constitutes a college experience. Because I mean, you can take uh, the college's curriculum and you can teach a high school class with that or you can teach a college class with it. What's the difference? And that's what they try to help you identify and strengthen so that your students when they later matriculate over to Salt Lake Community College or another program or another university, they're not surprised when they go up and say, well, well can I get extra credit? Or, you know, I didn't do this, um, but you can give me like, you don't have to give me a failing grade, you can give me a C. Um, so trying to give them a taste of reality while they're in your class and help them develop those soft skills. Uh, next one, that all parts of the CE evaluation will be completed. So we have the evaluation forum, which some of you have seen, some of you have not, and we want to make sure that all those parts are, are completed, along with the pre-evaluation, the evaluation, and the post-evaluation. They may have slightly different ways they work through each of those with you. It might be a conversation, it might be an email, and you're working on it on your own. But they'll make sure that all those parts are completed so you get the information that you need to hopefully grow and to improve. Uh, next, that you receive timely feedback on your evaluation. So once they do the evaluation, you should be able to log into MyCE and see those results within, uh, within one week of their, of their visit. Next, the student course evaluations are used to guide their evaluation. So the, whenever a faculty liaison or a college experience liaison visits your class, I mean, they're just getting a snapshot of that day, right? I mean, they don't really know what's going on the rest of the semester. And they can look in your Canvas course as well and kind of see how things are going. But the ones who really know, like, or can give you really good feedback on what you can do to improve the college experience are your students. And so we've designed the college or the, the student course evaluation to, uh, to integrate with the college experience evaluation that your liaisons do so that they can get a 360 degree view of what's going on in your class and give you feedback that you're like, yeah, that makes sense. And some of you might think, oh, well, you know, the, the students sometimes, like the feedback they give, not, not good. That's, we're finding that's not the case. So those who have used the, the, the faculty or the college experience liaisons that are using the uh, student course evaluations have found that, that most students sort of agree on the different points that they're, that they're going through and saying, is this present in class or not? And we have very few snarky comments. Um, there, are, there are always a few, it's kind of nice to see those, but the majority, like they give you some good feedback. Okay, and then, uh, let's see, so the last one is that you are reminded to complete your parts of the evaluation, because you've got a lot on your plate, uh, a lot of things you have to keep track of, it's hard to remember to do some of those things, but we will be sending you reminders, the college experience liaisons and the system itself will send you reminders prompting you what you need to do when you need to do it, so you don't have to think about that and worry about it. So that's what you can expect 
with uh, the, your college experience liaisons. So let's look at now how to review your CE liaison evaluation and how to administer those course evaluations. And I believe Robert is um, going to go through that. So let me switch over. I believe you need the browser, right? Yep. Okay. And I'm going to put that in. So that's the mic for mic. Okay, so yeah, I've been asked to talk on the CE evaluations, the college experience evaluations. So I guess you've seen three of the four uh, college experience liaisons up here. I'm the one over this, the STEM classes. So, um, so first before I start, let's just give you a rundown of what happens in the evaluation. So uh, there are three parts of the evaluation. There's a pre part. And usually what we do is we ask that you, there's a few questions we ask you to complete before. Whether that's, I, I know the way I do it is I send the questions out to my teachers, say, okay, I want you to answer these before. Or maybe the other liaisons, they may say, okay, you can do it in my scene, you can type it in yourself. I just copy and paste it. Um, we all will also ask you to, like Brennan said, do a student evaluation from your student's point of view. Uh, the student evaluation isn't a summative evaluation. That's, I hear that a lot. Well, this doesn't summarize the whole class. It's a formative evaluation to see what part of the college experience is happening in your class. And the way I thought I would do this is I'm just going from our website. Ugh. I was on a different computer, so. It's a Mac, not a PC. It's a Mac and not a PC, yes. Okay, how do I scroll? Is it two fingers? So, so uh, usually, so if you want to know how your students could get into the student evaluations, uh, you go on the student guide. And oops, and in the student guide, in one of their resources is rate your instructor. Um, I know it, when I send it out, I just send out the link and say, okay, here's where you go for your students. Give this to your students. What we have found instead of us saying, sending an email to the students, that if you guys do it, they'll answer more and they'll give you better feedback if you guys do it. So you. They click on this. You got to give them the CRN for your class so they know what class they're evaluating. Um, and well, let's just go into it real quick, just so you can see. So I'm just going to choose. Let's just go Alta because it's on top. And I'm just going to choose one of my instructors. Obviously, it's not going to have anything here yet. So uh, this way, if I see one blank, I know who did it. If I did it. So. Yeah, they get to rate you. They get to tell you why it's rated, and then they get 15 questions about the college expectations. And then they can, at the very end, they can put additional comments. And sometimes these additional comments give us a better idea what's there. OK, so now we got to figure out where we need to go to so you can actually access them. Uh, so let's see, Oop, not that one. So I'm just going to go back to the concurrent moment. So, and I'm going to go to um, the instructors page and the resources. Um, I'm going into tutorials because I wanted to make sure there was no student information on any of the pages I show you. Um, so with, within this, um, let's see, where's the one student evaluations? I know it's in here. Hold on. Oh, maybe it's at the bottom. Ah, here we are, viewing your student evaluations. So. 
once you log into MyCE, you'll notice there is a view offer courses. You hit on that. Once you go that, it will list your courses. And then you just hit on the view details button for that. And then, like I said, I wanted to make sure there was no student information, so that's why I'm going this way. Uh, at the top, next to the role, there will say download evaluations. And it will download it as an Excel file. And the top label on the columns is every question they asked you. So you can review that. Um, after, this, after you do this initial stuff, then we there's the college experience liaison makes the visit. We do that. And at the end, we will ask you to review the evaluation to make sure that it looks correct, that everything you reviewed it. And we ask that you actually go through it. You'll receive an email to do that. Now I'll show you how to do that. So it's only a, let's see, a fear. Let's see, finalizing here. Am I, I'm not going to have you watch the video, but there's certain parts. Uh, let me pause that. Ah, no thanks. Okay, so let's go back. So, ah, this is why I don't. You just really want to talk, yes. So what you do to review the college experience evaluation, you hit that CE evaluation button. And that will take you to the evaluation. Um, I believe we also send an email that will send you straight to it as well. Um, I don't see it from the, the teacher side, so you'll have to take my word on that because um, I don't see it from that side. So um, I'm going to jump ahead so you can see. At the end of the evaluation, once you read all our comments, there will be two decisions. There will be a decision you make. Do you want this to be a formative evaluation and we come, your liaison comes back for another evaluation? It's very rare that actually happens. I've had it happen a couple times. It's like, yeah, I want to see. And it could be for whatever reason, it was a bad day. Um, I've, I had a a one where they called a senior assembly and everyone left except one junior. So it was like, oh, yeah, well, I got to come back. I know I got to come back for that evaluation. So whatever reason, if you want us to come back, you can choose the first decision and you type in the date to say that, yes, I want the liaison to come back. If you are good to make it a summative evaluation, then you would click you to the other one, prove to submit this evaluation. Um, you click it that you agree it's a, a summary evaluation, and you type in your name. Um, and we will receive notice if you've done that or not. So make sure you finalize the evaluation. And I think that's it in terms of what you asked me to talk about. So any questions before we hand it back to Brandon? Okay, and I'll just emphasize too that uh, so when you get that reminder to finalize the evaluation, um, we really need you to do that. Um, that's something we haven't pushed a lot in the in the past, but for auditing purposes, we need to ensure that that visit occurred, and to, and and that you've recorded that it that it happened. So when you get the when you get the email, I think in the email we provide instructions for what you need to do. Um, but there's also this video, and like Robert said too, I just wanted to to reiterate. Um, that this is, it's a formative evaluation, meaning, so you got a formative evaluation and summative. Summative is like good or bad. Um, formative is like, how do we help you to become better? So like I said before, when the liaison comes out and visits your classroom, uh, they only see that once, one time in the entire semester. If it's a day where things were falling apart, the kids were all on one, or you were up late last night because you were at the hospital with some family emergency, 
and you're like, this is not a typical day, can we redo this? Then the answer is absolutely. So you just have to let your liaison know, um, hey, this was not reflective of a typical day, can we redo it? And they'll, they'll, they'll uh, absolutely do that. Okay, let's see, we're just about done here. Let's see what else we've got. And, okay, I think, I think that's everything. So thank you all of you for all of the work that you do. Um, we really appreciate you and we, we couldn't do this work without you. I mean, you are like the, the, the cornerstone or the keystone for like concurrent enrollment holding together. Um, so thank you for all you do. Uh, are there any final questions that you all have about anything else? Yes. Um, simple syllabus. Oh yeah, we forgot that. Yeah. yeah. How did that? Yeah. So simple syllabus. Let me. That's. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah, I don't know how that slide got missed, but it did, because we dropped the ball. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I believe we have, we have a tutorial on how to, how to do that, right? So let me go to the instructor tutorials. So go to the concurrent enrollment page, down to CE instructors, and then over here on the left are the tutorials for CE instructors. And we have using simple syllabus in Canvas. Is that the, is that the one? Okay. So there's a video tutorial there and a PDF tutorial. And I believe, so does that one show how to use it in the high school canvas? So, Brandon, unless it's been updated, no. It shows how to do it in the Canvas, but not how to pull it over to our Okay. Do you want to do a quick demo? On... Okay, yeah. Yeah, here, take that. Okay, I'll let David chat about it. He's super familiar with it. Uh, so, so historically, we've we've used a platform called MyCE to harmonize course syllabuses. Right, college faculty submit a, a, a syllabus to to MyCE. High school instructors look at it, personalize it, resubmit it, and then you get told, "Yeah, this is fine or not." This is something we've been doing really, really successfully for at least as long as I've been at SLCC. I like to think the college has noticed and is using simple syllabus to standardize the practice across the board. I'm not sure if they're following our lead or not, but what we're doing is essentially moving that practice to um, simple syllabus. And it originates or begins and, and it's in SLCC's Canvas. So this is this PDF tutorial. At some point in the next couple of days, all of you can log into your SLCC Canvas class and we're gonna look for this button. Um, once we get into the class, it's this simple syllabus button. This is going to take us to the simple syllabus site. And on that site, we're going to find a copy, hopefully, of our academic department's institutional standard syllabus. All right, this is something where you're going to need to have a conversation probably with your faculty liaison because it's going to really rely on the work that they've done to make that syllabus available to simple syllabus. But we go into simple syllabus, we set the, 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 the um, we change the settings to make it visible to the public. We go through, and essentially we have the syllabus broken into modules and we can go through, some of them are editable, like our contact information, meeting times, potentially a schedule, where we're meeting. Other parts are not editable. Grading schemes, required texts, required course materials, DEI statements. And we go through and we harmonize our syllabus with what is available on Simple Syllabus. All right. Once we've done in the same way that we've done it on my CE, for those of you who are, who are pros, we're essentially just going and we're looking at the syllabus using a different document. Once we have harmonized it, once we've set it up, once we've finished it, and it's a couple of steps, you can see there are a couple of pages. Um, we go, we sub submit it successfully, and it's going to create for us two pieces of information. One is a downloadable PDF. And we can take that copy of our new syllabus as a PDF and we can post it in a high school canvas. We can email it to parents, guardians, administrators, to anybody who's looking for it. We can embed it wherever we want to or need to. All right, the syllabus exists as a PDF. We can also link to it. And if we've made it public, then we can just send people a link and they can visit that link. All right, so simple syllabus lives in SLCC's canvas 
but we can export the information wherever we need it to. The good news with this is that unlike my CE, once we've made a syllabus in simple syllabus, we can refer back to that syllabus as long as we're teaching the class. So if you're teaching in fall, at some point in the next week, you might spend 10 minutes putting your syllabus together. And if you're teaching again in spring, you can go back to simple syllabus and say, where's that syllabus I made in August? Oh, here it is. Boom, I'm putting it in place. So there's a little bit of a hurdle. We're getting used to a new system. But if you've been teaching concurrent enrollment for, for more than a year, you're already familiar with the process. We're just changing the platform a little bit. So we have a video guide for it. We have a PDF guide for it. And your college experience liaisons and faculty liaisons are in place to help you practice this. So if you're saying, look, it's just not clicking for me, give one of us a call. And we'll talk to you. We'll talk you through it. We'll figure it out. Questions or thoughts or concerns about this? Yes, please. Kind of. The syllabus hopefully is built for you. This is what's different. It's hopefully we're going to log, hopefully, cross our fingers, right? Hopefully we're going to log in and the syllabus will be there. All we're going to do is personalize it. So your department will have created this default syllabus and you'll say, well, my name, my email, my phone number, if you want to give your students that, you know, my meeting times, my location, and then everything else is already in place. And then you just click export and it gives you a PDF and you can do whatever you need to with the PDF. Does that clarify that? That's a little more clear. I skipped over, I don't know if you saw, I skipped over six pages of slides here. So there, it's a little, there's a couple of steps that I skipped over, but essentially we're responding to something that's been made for us. Um, and hopefully, hopefully it's a little simpler than, than processes have been in the past. Great questions. Any other questions? Does that respond to the concern? Yes, thank you very much. You're awesome. Thanks for raising it. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, David. And, and I'll add, too, that so Simple Syllabus is a, it, you can access Simple Syllabus outside of Slick Canvas. So there is a Simple Syllabus, the software company has its own site. And so you can take that link and then students can access it over there. The nice thing with the link, if you use the link rather than the PDF, is that it'll then track whether your students are engaging in the syllabus or not and reading through it, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, you've got those, those options. You could basically just take the syllabus section in your high school canvas, post the link or the PDF right there, and then they'd be able to access your simple syllabus that way. Okay, is there anything else I forgot? Or any other questions that you have, general questions about teaching concurrent enrollment? Okay, if not, be sure to grab some more food. Like I said, we got a ton of it. Um, take your stipend forms, make sure you've signed those and deliver them in the back there. You're welcome to hang out and continue conversations. But thank you everyone and have a wonderful 2024, 2025.